It's still good outside. You're in Hungary, right? Yes. I'm uh, northeast, actually. We just moved mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. Which city is it? And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's warmer than usual mm -hmm. these days. And um, I think it's around 13 already okay. outside. But it, there was a slight rain uh, early in the morning. Which city, so which city do you live in? I just moved out to a tiny village. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Tiny village is always good. So I, I used to live in uh, Debrecen, which uh -huh. is close to the Romanian border. It's the second uh, largest city of Hungary. But you know, Hungary is uh, the capital and then just smaller cities mm. otherwise. So there is nothing... Um, you mean Budapest, think, right? Yeah, nothing like Budapest. It's uh, the mm. second largest city, so it's like 220,000. Yeah. So no other... Uh, half a million or million uh, cities in in Hungary just to just put a bit. Let me, you know, I'm curious about Hungary because I've been there recently uh, with my with my girlfriend. We've spent a week in in Budapest, and um, we we actually liked it very much in that city. And I've been curious about the political situation over there because it attracts a lot of criticism. You know, I just want to hear a comment from someone who lives over there in Hungary. Yeah. Um... I think it's a it's a bit more uh, nuanced or complicated than yeah. what's usually reported in mainstream. Yeah, obviously, Western, that's that's almost always the case. Western media, because uh, often these uh, mainstream media outlets just uh, keep pushing the same uh, narratives. Absolutely. And if if, if anything doesn't fit uh, the narratives, then uh, they start um, adding uh, adjectives or display. Descriptions like mm. racist, mm -hmm. uh, fas fa fascism, and <laughs> all these kinds oh, yeah. of things. Far right extremist, and all. <laughs> you know, that's uh, a little. I find it this very. Uh, what would you say? Um, disingenuous, and um, it. I find that appalling because because if these terms have a specific meaning, and they they are pretty. What would you say? They refer to dangerous groups of people, and you you're not just going to throw them around as if everyone is a fascist and a racist. You have to be really careful with these words. I think uh, they have an audience and they they want to maintain uh, the these views in a very consistent ways. Mm. So if anything threatens uh, those views, then they uh, start calling... As we say in Hungarian, but probably it's it's coming from German. Start yeah. uh, crying wolf. So uh, it's it's very dangerous uh, that they say the opposite or they say something different. Different. Uh, this is the the very basis. And yeah, that it's it's no co not a coincidence that we moved out uh, from the city and to a very small village. We are far away from uh, everything mm. right now. Actually. The, the the original plan was to buy something with a much larger land area so that we can uh, start building up a kind of a self uh, uh, sustainable or self self sufficiency uh, mm -hmm. farming and 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 uh, everything but uh, it didn't really work out uh, 100% as planned this is uh, quite normal so um, i think we will we will rely on some of the groceries still <laughs> going forward for at least uh, one, one and a half years more. Yeah. But, uh, well, we already have a large uh, garden and, uh, and a hillside uh, where the chicken can roam. Mm. Uh, and we, we have uh, the pastured uh, free range eggs already. And uh, hopefully next spring we can plant uh, all those uh, vegetables and things that we um we will consume so um yeah but but there is not enough land for the feed for for animals so you you need um i think that the old saying here goes something like you need uh an acre for two cows oh yeah so if, you, if you if you want to uh, graze um uh the cows then uh, you need what is the other measurements which is approximately half an acre I, I don't know the the English name. Uh, mm. Probably it's the acre, and the hectare is the bigger one. Oh yeah, so hectare, hectare is the is bigger the 10, one. Ten thousand, and then the acre is like five point five thousand. So yeah, you need an acre for for one cow. 
Oh, that's, wow. uh, that's the rule of thumb. And if you need two cows, then you need two, ac uh, two acres. And, and if you uh, would like to plant uh, for, for the feed, for the chicken or, or, or uh, the, the pig, for example, then you need even more. So um, it's it's not that uh, not that easy. Then then you need the machinery because it's not just blowing by hand anymore. <laughs> if you have a larger <laughs> area, so not it's, anymore. It's, it's difficult. We we have to plan it uh, over and over. Again. Okay, but you're still planning on expanding your ranch, let's say. Yeah, now we are debt free, completely debt. Oh, that's that's, per no, that's no, perfect. No mortgage and no 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 debts uh, of any kind. That was among the the plan mm. uh, uh, because i think that uh, hard times are coming and we are just in the middle of uh, this thing so we have at least one and a half years more yeah. to, to survive and then it, it's going to be difficult uh, because i'm not really a conspiracy theorist you know i'm, I'm no go I'm, ahead you know i have this platform to talk about everything so if there's I, anything I, you want to say just go ahead i'm a scientist by training but uh, if you develop a kind of a critical thinking and, and uh, individual evalu evaluation of uh, data or information in general, then uh, some of us have this uh, uh, view of things slightly in, in a different way than others. So we, we, we kind of uh, uh, view things differently and uh, have a different uh, perspective very, very often and also I think that we evaluate information differently and spot uh, inconsistencies or, oh, yeah. or uh, and and then often if if you don't do not agree uh, with other people with with mainstream view then you are called a conspiracy theorist of course uh, why why is just uh, and all these other terms you know you're a conspiracy theorist you're a extremist you're a denier you're a fascist and a racist and a sexist and like lumping yeah. all these terms together and just calling you everything. <laughs> and that that is just an attempt, not an attempt, but a way of, you know, dispensing with the necessity to engage with you in an, in an honest and productive argument. So yeah, what, what, I, what I believe is that actually is the other way around, because uh, those people who are less able to think out of the box or don't have this different uh, perspective and they are not used to uh, drawing their own conclusions when when seeing uh, a bunch of information or different data uh, they just uh, tend to follow uh, the central narratives yeah. that uh, this is how things are and you better believe because we have the experts and mm -hmm, the science mm -hmm. is uh, on our side and these kind of arguments and, and of course, they are not able to uh, to do their own evaluation or they are not used to uh, do their own evaluation and uh, they don't have this mindset of recognizing some patterns. And this, I think that this is this is one of the uh, the uh, unique uh, skills of, of uh, some people that they, they see patterns differently mm. than, than others. And when you recognize a pattern, uh, you start uh, reading uh, more about it. That uh, some, so, so something must be there, and then that when you do this, uh, you do your own research, reading, and and I myself uh, um, almost always uh, do research in in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. Of course, not not when it, not when it's uh, history or or uh, mm -hmm. historical events or or politics or these kind of things. But otherwise, when it comes to science, I always do my own research in the in the scientific literature. And then um, you inadvertently draw your own conclusions based on what you read. Mm. And, and if you see different patterns, you draw different conclusions. Mm. And if you draw different conclusions, you, you are called a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> most <laughs> of them. So that, that's, that's how it is. And there is no open discussion about no. uh, almost, almost anything. So um, actually, one of the things I can, I can mention that... Um, yeah. In, in March 2020, when all this uh, COVID uh, hysteria began, mm -hmm. um, I, I had a look at uh, the data, the first data coming out of uh, of China, of, you know, these big cruise ships mm -hmm. and what's happening in Italy. And, um, oh, I, it was it was about old people, uh, mostly old people uh, dying uh, with this disease. So what should we do now? I, I, I thought that uh, we should have... Uh, arranged some kind of uh, immunization camps for for the kids 
Mm. Because it was, it was very obvious from, from the very beginning that uh, this uh, virus rep- represented no uh, risk uh, to kids. So no, of course. Instead, we closed kindergartens and gyms. Yeah, you know? I even volunteered my own kids. I suggested that, okay, let's throw the kids into some... Uh, uh, let's uh, present movies to them and, and, and uh, let's... We just uh, let them uh, have uh, some fun. Mm. Uh, why they uh, catch the virus and and then uh, get over it and then they yeah. can be safely released back to society mm-hmm. and they are all protected and they will this way protect uh, the elderly because that's the most uh, straightforward thing uh, before we had any kind of uh, vaccines it was the thing to do you know they had the smallpox parties for example well, in yeah. villages uh, for <laughs> kids because that was the safe way to to control, uh, you knew that the, the, if, if somebody developed uh, smallpox, that they, they escorted all the kids into the same room and they were mm. playing along uh, all day and you knew that they yeah, would wow. get uh, the virus. And then you, you could follow uh, without any surprises uh, uh, with, with regard to timing or... or That's unimaginable or, from today's point of view, to have these sort of, all sorts of things happen. But, uh, but obviously is, it makes sense. If you, it makes sense from a from a virological standpoint because if 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 the young people uh, get the disease, you know, and most most of the people are not uh, like crazily susceptible to contracting a serious form of the of the disease and suffering from severe consequences. That's the elderly people. But if most of the young people get infected actually and get over the disease, and that can happen pretty quickly if you let it happen then you immediately reach a certain level of herd immunity and then kind of the problem is solved more or less yeah i think we could have uh, even um, encourage people and the virus to to meet <laughs> so to say I'm, I'm i'm talking about the the possible um event of uh, variolation so that you intentionally uh, inoculate because then you can control the dose the, the dose matters a lot and uh, the the infection route uh, mm. matters a lot if it goes straight to your lungs or it is ca- it is captured in in the in the nose mm-hmm. so if you just uh, introduce some aerosols into the into the nose it's it's very different uh, a controlled amount uh, low dose it's very yeah. different from inhaling a high dose into your straight into your lungs so uh, this you, you, we could even have uh, some could have had some some control over how how this uh, pans out, but uh, we chose uh, instead of yeah the, the the second best option was just letting it rip and trying to protect uh, old people and and uh, and uh, severely ill people. But mm-hmm. it, it just uh, uh, you were again called a conspiracy theorist and uh, you were um, blamed for uh, letting uh, the grand grandmothers die and this kind oh, of oh yeah. Things. Which was it really became very because... emotional. It became very emotional and uh, like, uh, you know, m- pretending that people were to blame for the, for the death of others. You know, that's very slippery slope, something you have to be extremely careful, careful with. Because like, basically, all of your actions have consequences. And you can't just say, like, this one action was responsible for killing people. Like, to say that, you have to be extremely, extremely careful with your words. But the, the, the one thing I want to mention, an interesting pattern that I observed in our health community is that basically, like virtually every single one of us who was once critical of the mainstream narrative as far as nutrition is concerned, you know, had an easier time recognizing the pattern, you know, that um, was laying itself out over the past couple of years. And also now with the whole climate agenda, let's call it that. So yeah, this is this is very interesting for me because that was not the case for the plant-based folks. They place basically all went along. That's that was yeah. really interesting for me for, to observe. There are a few exceptions, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's also because they of are uh, some of the plant-based uh, folks, at least at least the long timers. They they have also gone through this uh, fighting fighting narratives. Uh, yeah, I interviewed because... Dr. Joel Kahn on my podcast, yeah, and he's yeah. been extremely <laughs> critical. And that's why I wanted to have him on. I think it's it's uh, it has a lot to do with uh, with uh, how open you can still remain to to new information, mm. because uh, there is a lot of religion in in nutrition, and uh, and uh, 
and and there is a tendency a lot of people uh, are very easy to capture by by these religious views in general so if somebody uh, signs um, up for for any religious uh, dietary uh, group they they are also uh, more easy to to capture so to say with other uh, religious ideas so i think this is in general um, certain types of people are easier to to capture by by these religious views in in general mm. and uh, there are those who who are skeptic by nature mm. and, and they they would they would also always like to see uh, some supporting evidence and and they they prefer to do their own uh, evaluation of of data so this is uh, the two types of of uh, very basic types of uh, people, what I see. Yeah, and the and the and the latter part of people, they are also driven by exploring truth. Like they don't just say, "Oh, let's follow the narrative," because because we we just listen to what authority tells us to do, because they know everything better. They're the experts, etc. They actually they're actually interested in finding out what's actually true, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it is called a conspiracy theory. Like conspiracy theory means nothing else but there is something big that might be going on like it's it possible it's possible that it's wrong maybe even it's very likely to be wrong but it might also be correct and so it's just a theory and so it might turn out to be true it might turn out turn out to be wrong but i don't i don't care if you call it this or that i care about is it true is it going on or not and so these people who are driven to find it out they're the ones who well, I don't know. I think I think they're the ones who are the most trustworthy ones and who are more most likely to to be uh, to to pay attention to these patterns that you alluded to. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but I think especially when it comes to biology, mm -hmm. then uh, we have uh, nutrition, we have virology, and and uh, infectious diseases, and um, but, uh, then uh, nothing is uh, black black or white. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, we 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 have had a very complex uh, evolutionary exposure to to different agents and different uh, uh, food and and uh, it's basically the environmental uh, interactions for for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. So uh, nothing is uh, very straightforward uh, mm. how it looks and. Uh, this is when I tend to smile a little bit when people apply thermodynamics uh, to obesity, for example, as a, as a one one to one uh, correlation that uh, you have uh, energy coming in, energy coming out. Um, okay, that's that's probably true, but it's 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 not how the biological drivers uh, work, because uh, for example, the laws of thermodynamics uh, do not suggest any uh, directional. Uh, causation. Mm. So, what causes what and why? There is no why and and uh, no uh, direction in within those uh, laws of thermodynamics. And then uh, there is this human uh, thing that uh, we tend to associate things. Uh, we have these pre pre uh, judices and pre preconceptions about things, and we automatically uh, associate uh, these to to the problem at hand. And uh, if there is a problem, and that if uh, if um, we we know that uh, thermodynamics mm. apply uh, to obesity, for example, then we are absolutely certain that uh, it must be uh, gluttony and sloth what what causes uh, obesity, mm. because it's uh, just mm -hmm. a human behavioral problem, which is of course uh, bollocks. But uh, it's it's so easy to fall. Uh, for this, because this is this has an emotional part, and and uh, it's very difficult to distance ourselves from yeah. from, from the emotions when when observing or evaluating uh, information. Yeah, well, but um, to 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 give the devil's due, you know, obviously we have to rely on something. So you cannot understand or even create a model if you do not already have a preconception of something of something else. You know what I mean? So um, if you if you if you try to understand an idea, then it, it has to rely on something that's already pre-existing. 
it's it's very difficult to come up with something that's that's en entirely new. That's why, like for example, when we talk about lipoproteins, for example, we we imagine that there are kind of like boats that transport things, and we don't know if that's true. But that but we know in the real world scenario we have things that transport other things, like we have ships, we have cars. It's normal for us to observe transport vehicles, and that's why we use these analogies. So many things, also uh, with enzymes, we use the key and the lock analogy because that's how we, we think. We, we need to have something to rely upon. So um, to some degree, it's not surprising that this happens all the time in science, that we may f make potentially false preconception. But I mean, what's the alternative? We have, to, we, have to, we have to rely on something, you know, it's very difficult to disentangle these things. Yeah, but I think that this this is also very dangerous because this kind of locks you into that certain box, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to think out of that box. Mm -hmm. uh, and if if and, and after a while, if you, if you spend a lot of a lot of time, a lot of uh, financial resources, and a lot of uh, um, um, investment, uh, intellectual investment in in certain uh, things. It's very, very difficult to, to say that, uh, okay, I was wrong and let's start oh, yeah. over. So, so it keeps rolling, it keeps rolling. And, and uh, when, when some people come, and, and that's why outsiders uh, can be so useful in, in these mm. things. They have, a, they have a kind of a baby uh, view on, on some of these things. And, and uh, you know, anything, uh, everything is new to an infant. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they have to build this uh, from 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 the very basics, uh, and they have they can have very good very basic questions, mm. which we which we I mean we because in some areas I'm I'm also considered an expert, which 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 experts uh, have huge difficulties uh, with with uh, just stepping out of that uh, certain box. No, I perfectly I I totally agree with that. I heard you talking on um, several occasions with. People like Iva, Iva Cummins and uh, Brian Sanders. I actually had Brian two times on my podcast. He's an amazing guy. And he's not, uh, he's not like medically trained or scientifically trained. Neither is Iva Cummins. Neither is like people like Del Dave Feldman. But these are like, just to name three people that I've learned a lot from. Like they've been extremely helpful for various reasons. Maybe because of their engineering background, backgrounds. That's what all of them have in common, interestingly enough. Yeah, I also had my my turns with uh, with engineers. I worked with uh, industrial uh, complex industrial processes and and uh, problem solving these processes. It's it's it's. Uh, I think it's very useful. Uh, did you did you start by um, being an engineer? No, uh, I'm trained as a molecular biologist. Okay. And then I worked in in um, in uh, pharmaceuticals uh, like as, as a sales rep, and then. Uh, I worked with laboratory equipment, and I was a product specialist in surgical procedures. Mm. Among, among them, for example, bariatric uh, surgery mm -hmm. and um, endoscopic surgeries. And then I worked with industrial enzymes and uh, and microbes. Uh, so, um, and then uh, that was when I uh, got to work with engineers in in different uh, industrial. Uh, Processing plants, and and uh, you know it's it requires a different mindset uh, approaching, and these these are complex uh, microbiological processes. Mm. Uh, for example, fermentation of alcohol or other uh, biomolecules, and um, the processing of grains to to create uh, sugars or different uh, other. Uh, molecules mm -hmm. or different uh, starches and and the starch derivatives, for example. So um, they have a plant. Uh, it, it's it's been around for 60 years or something like that, 50, 60 years. Uh, that there has been a huge evolution of uh, the enzymes used, the processes used, uh, a lot of adjustments. But still, the the, the process is complex and. Uh, very small things can wreak uh, havoc on on their uh, processes, and and uh, the profit margins are low. So if mm. you can find one percent ex extra yield, for example, or 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 one percent reduction in energy cost, and these kind of things, these have huge value 
uh, for them. So it's uh, it's 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 an extreme fine tuning of of uh, complex uh, processes. Mm -hmm. So um, this this also requires stepping behind and okay, I, I understand the basics, but uh, what can go wrong? It's uh, you cannot explain what you see with your with your understanding. So what can go wrong? And sometimes it's just that you have uh, you know the mixers. Uh, with the plates and and uh, it occurred one or two times uh, in my careers that the the plates uh, broke off the mixer and the mm. mixer did almost nothing but sometimes it did something and sometimes and most most often it did nothing and you, you see these uh, crazy uh, spikes of of uh, inconsistencies in the process and yeah. it's very difficult to find out and, and finally you, you go back to a certain tank that, that there must be something in the tank. So just empty the tank, open the tank and just look inside because we, we have no clue what, what, what's happening. Wow. And then uh, suddenly you see that there is a mixer with a lot of uh, plates and then uh, most of the plates uh, uh, were broken off. So um, it's uh, and you can do whatever modeling uh, on a computer. It's, it's very difficult to get to these uh, uh, strange uh, problems. But sometimes, uh, and, and, and you can also see the same things that uh, people run these uh, processes all day, you know, uh, 24 by 7, mm -hmm. uh, all weeks, all months, all days of the year, yeah, where they have some maintenance uh, stops, but otherwise they do the same thing all over again. Yeah. And if something something unexpected uh, occurs, uh, that, that pops up, then they, they, they can't uh, handle it because they are so so much so deeply in in that uh, certain box of uh, how yeah. this thing works uh, so they they needed some outsider we, mm. we could often deliver this outsider view that uh, okay i understand the, the your process but but i also see uh, different plants other plants yeah. uh, li a little bit different processes so let me have a let me think about it and and uh, we could often deliver uh, solutions which which was uh, difficult for them Mm. Not because they were stupid or, or anything like that, but they were so heavily uh, invested in their own process mm -hmm. in that certain box that uh, they were unable to step outside and and uh, think outside that uh, specific uh, box. So yeah. I think it, it requires a, a specific mindset, which, which is not easy to develop. Uh, probably you have to be born uh, with uh, some of this uh, mindset and, and then uh, it's, it's also a skill so you can develop. So I agree. I, I, I think it's many things. I, I think it's a temperamental thing where you very open to learning new things. That's like number one. Because you can only have this broad view on things if you... Well, obviously you have to have some curiosity first, right? So you have to be curious enough to learn and understand these sorts of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Then you have to be like slightly creative to come up with ideas. Then, but, but like curiosity is not enough. You actually have to have some knowledge. Like um, D Dave Feldman and Ivor Cummins, they were able to recognize these patterns and come to certain conclusions because they had their engineering background. So they always al also had something to rely upon, which was partly knowledge-based, partly skill-based. Um, but the more, you, uh, the more you inform yourself and expand your skill sets in different areas, the more will you be able, I believe, to, 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 to find better solutions to any given problem. And oftentimes what scientists have, they're caught in their like science bubble. The, 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 the doctors I ca are caught in their uh, doctor bubble where they're taught to think a certain way. And um, not, that's not to say that that's bad because sometimes you really need to you're really looking for an expert that's who's really good at one specific thing and who is really good at that. Like sometimes you need that, but oftentimes the pro the problems are just way too complicated. Like metabolic health, that's just so unbelievably complicated that a, 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 a doctor trained with a certain mindset is just not sufficient to solve the problem. You need more. You need a broader view. You need a psychological view. You need a um, you need a immun immunological view. You need the scientific view. You need like all these different skill sets to, to, to find out what the crux of the problem is and how to properly um, uh, how to properly find how to find a proper solution for it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's very important to to not uh, continue uh, a train of thought where where others have left off. Mm -hmm. Because if if you if you approach a problem. Uh, right at the point 
uh, where where others uh, left off, you you are already closed in the, in that box again. Mm, I see. Because that's that's how the problem is presented. Uh, for example, yeah, that's that's an anecdote. Uh, once I was asked that uh, we have we have this uh, strange color problem with uh, with one of the sugar syrups, and um, it's it's it looks like uh, this orange is orangish color, and we have absolutely no clue what can uh, cause this. We checked uh, all the cleaning steps. You know, they have uh, huge uh, chromatography and 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 uh, other cleaning steps and. Mm. We just can't solve uh, this problem. Okay, then I had a look at the the sample. It well, it looks like rust. <laughs> rust. It's 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 impossible. Why why is it impossible? I mean, it looks like rust. It it tastes like rust, and then it's it's rust. Looks why like a duck. Walks have... like a duck. Then probably it is a yeah, duck. Yeah, we have we have stainless steel tanks. We have uh, some some machinery which which is. Uh, which is carbon steel, but the insulation is just the most advanced, the Japanese, German, whatever technologies, yeah. rubber, whatever, and, and it's simply impossible. I mean, I, don't, I just see rust, so if there is rust, it's not impossible. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a basic logical failure that uh, if, if it looks like rust, it's, it's rust. Let's uh, go through the, the process and where you have those carbon steel uh, equipments, and mm -hmm. then, yeah, the insulation was broken on mm. one of these and it was uh, leaking rust into the syrup so that that was it it's, if, wow. it's, if it if it looks like uh, rust it tastes like rust then it's rust so <laughs> yeah 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 that's yeah that's that's funny and i um you reminded me of something that that fairly frequently hap happens in medicine. Like if we see, especially with chronic conditions, like we have a problem, we have no clue what to do with it. We just apply the same techniques that we used to applying to other diseases over and over again. We're like, let's find a way to di diagnose it. Let's give it a name. You know, we have to call it something. It has to be like type 2 diabetes and it's not related to anything else. And then we find out which drug we can treat it with. And then we see what happens and it doesn't work. And we look for another drug and we look for another drug and for better diagnosis. So it's like always the same thing, but you don't get out of that cycle. And obviously we, we, we ha still haven't solved that problem. Yeah, it's a, when we go back to this um, for example the the obesity problem mm -hmm. and when you when you see outside outsider engineers uh, approaching the problem uh, they usually start with okay what has changed mm -hmm. because there was no obesity uh, problem 100 years ago or 50 50 years ago what has changed something must have changed because uh, the the people are changing or keep changing uh, we are getting more and more obese so something has changed if it's not in our genetics which is most certainly not mm -hmm. then uh, it must be in the em environment so then yeah. have a look at the environmental changes um, and then uh, you need to identify those uh, potentially uh, contributing to the problem and then then it's that then, then comes the scientific approach is there a, a uh, plausible mechanism uh, for for these uh, environmental factors. So you have a list of factors. For example, you have I don't know the increase of seed oil uh, consumption, the increase of uh, refined carbohydrate consumption, mm -hmm. the increase of sedentary behavior, and, and and so on. So you have like a dozen or two dozens of uh, factors, and then you uh, start having a look if. Uh, uh, one of these, uh, or how many of these have uh, the plausible mechanisms uh, for for driving, for, for mm -hmm. being in the driver's seat. And then There's a problem uh, though, you know, I, I totally agree. And um, I agree that the environment has to be the one that's driving it because genetics don't change that quickly in a matter of like a couple of decades. There's a problem though, because over the last, over the past, say, I don't know, 100 years, just let's pick, pick, a, pick a number for sake of um, simplicity. Um, so many things have changed that it's just completely incomprehensible. And there's many problems with that. Not only is it hard to identify all these variables, because first of all, we can name many things that have changed that could have an impact on obesity. But then there is many things that have changed that we don't know might have an impact on, obes on obesity. And then the, no the, no the next problem is, Many things go hand in hand with each other. There's this unhealthy user bias or healthy user bias effect. So you don't know whether you're measuring an effect of a variable 
that's due to another thing. So the actual thing you're measuring has nothing to do with obesity. But let's, mm, well, let's pick meat consumption. Like we both probably would agree that that's not driving disease because, well, for, for a bunch of reasons. But because people who eat meat, they also live an unhealthy lifestyle most of the time. That's why they become sick. So it's like it's very difficult to parse out which of these variables actually do have an effect and which don't, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, uh, that's the that's the very basics of uh, how to start when, yeah. you, when you sort out uh, that it's not genetics, it's environment. Actually, it's, it's not even true uh, to some extent because uh, how it started, it was probably only environmental. But uh, by now we have a huge epigenetic influence because oh, you know obese mothers then uh, the the offsprings are way more likely to to become uh, metabolically challenged or 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 obese again. Mm -hmm. So even if, if it was even shown in in animal uh, models that uh, uh, the sperm of the father can deliver some uh, epigenetic alterations uh for for at least two generations so you can get wow. some stuff from your grandfather if if he was obese uh, when your father was conceived and so on and so forth so mm. it becomes more complex definitely but uh, it 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 definitely also didn't start uh the problem in the in the no. 70s or or something like that because mm -hmm. then there were no uh, many generations of of obese people Mm -hmm. uh in the society so it didn't start uh, that way but now it contributes so yeah. you have to you have to integrate uh, other uh, areas of uh, science of course yeah and it's so and, complicated because uh, even these epigenetic changes they can affect not only physiology on a what would you say on an endocrinological or physiological no not physiological but enzymatic level like we're talking about I don't know, uh, insulin levels and all of these things, but it could also potentially may maybe very likely happen on a psychological level because uh, essentially what drives behavior is our brain or nervous system tells us what we should do, what we should eat, etc. And so what if you have a bunch of uh, uh, um, epigenetic changes that affect the way you search for food? Maybe that it affects your taste. Maybe it affects... I don't know, many things we can't even think about because the, the body is so incredibly complicated, right? But, um, and also, and also, uh, you, you should not, uh, we, we, we should not forget that um, obese parents are more likely to put their child in an environment that's more likely to make them obese. So yes. I don't know how to, how to take these things apart and how to disentangle them. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, what uh, actually led me to to start mm -hmm. from turn it all all over uh, and and uh, start from the very bottom. Try to try to understand uh, the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms which which uh, drive feeding behavior, and also I started examining. Uh, Maybe Gabor, real quickly before we go ahead, um, just give a quick introduction. We missed that in the beginning. Just, just, okay. just tell um, uh, what your background is and what you're focusing now in, as far as research, research is concerned, and then we can continue talking about obesity. Okay, I'm, I'm Gabor Adeshi. I'm a Hungarian molecular biologist. Uh, I've never worked in academia, so um, uh, I've been in different uh, industries, uh, starting in pharmaceuticals mm. and laboratory equipment, and then uh, I was a um, surgical specialist in different surgical procedures, uh, mostly in, in uh, hemostasis, so stopping uh, blood uh, leaking and, and uh, in uh, laparoscopic uh, okay. procedures. Uh, uh, among them, I worked in, in, uh, with bariatric surgeons, for okay. example. And uh, later on, I moved to industri industrial biotechnology worked with industrial enzymes and, and microbes and fermentation. And uh, most recently, I've been working as a uh, R&D consultant, management uh, consultant uh, in different areas, industrial food and, uh, and uh, metabolic profiling uh, as, as, as examples. Um, and uh, my Research areas are mostly, not exclusively, but mm -hmm. mostly uh, completely private. 
for personal, so to say. It's not. It's not. Much of this is not directly related to my uh, daily work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been doing it as a kind of a passion uh, thing. It started. It started off uh, with my own weight loss journey. Mm. It was nine years ago, mm-hmm. and and uh, I started with reading uh, books. You know these diet guru books, and then uh, I found them uh lacking uh with regard to the scientific uh, concept and explanations so i went on to to read uh, the scientific uh, literature reviews first then i ended up with reading mostly um experimental uh, studies mm-hmm. on on uh, humans whenever whenever possible but also in in animal animal models mm. um, because some experiments just can be done uh, in humans, sure. or so it's very difficult or very costly. But uh, I try, I always try to look for confirmatory evidence uh, derived from humans whenever, whenever possible. Sure. And uh, and uh, yeah, I started out with uh, looking at uh, obesity and then uh, diabetes. Mm-hmm. Uh, diabetes and metabolic syndrome is still uh, one of the core uh, research areas I'm, I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, but I'm. I've gradually moved uh, on from from uh, the most popular uh, areas like uh, skeletal muscle and exercise, uh, uh, the, imp- the impact of this on, on metabolic diseases, mm. to first I think it was the liver uh, physiology and uh, I, I was looking, I was, I've been always looking for a complex uh, organs because it, it, oh, must, yeah. it, it this is complex so it must be driven by by a complex uh, organ then yeah I liver was a good liver. decision then if you're I looking for a complex liver, organ I, I had some uh, detours to to brain uh, behavioral oh, connections one. Between, between feeding and and uh, these kind of things and then uh, i realized that uh, i think it came to me when when i realized that uh, uh, liver fat is uh, <clears throat> mostly not created in the liver, but mm. it's uh, six, something like 60%, almost two thirds, is derived from from adipose tissues, from from your fat cells. Mm-hmm. Or so there there must be some huge influence uh, of of uh, fat cells on liver physiology because liver keeps accumulating this fat coming in from from your fat stores. And then I moved to adipose tissue biology mm. and uh, spent quite some time, I think uh, we can say years, in uh, digging into adipose tissue uh, physiology, like adipogenesis, how uh, uh, adipose, uh, how fat cells are created and how uh, they can uh, expand when when challenged, when being challenged. Uh, One in, I think uh, after a couple of years, one of my friends uh, started calling calling me the the adipocyte Jedi. (laughs) <laughs> because I was so deep uh, in in the details, and um, then uh, one of these uh, clues uh, came to me when when I was studying adipogenesis that uh, inflammation and some bacterial inflammatory compounds have a huge impact on on uh, adipogenesis, how the fat cells mm-hmm. uh, behave, uh, how they are created and, and or or being uh, stopped from from uh, developing. For example, and then uh, I started having a look. Uh, it was not too far away because uh, if you study, uh, if you research uh, adipose tissues, uh, f- fat cells, then you realize that uh, the distribution and the, the, the different kinds of uh, fat cells which exist uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a very fascinating uh, area in itself. But you realize that these are the, not all fat cells were created equal. Yeah. So uh, you have some uh, so-called visceral fat and then uh, you have different uh, fu- functional, physically uh, functional uh, fat pads which which uh, protect from from uh, physical impact for example behind your eyes and mm. uh, so you you recognize that uh, uh, fat cells and adipose tissues are a very heterogeneous uh, tissue so it's not like you have a fat cell which stores fat and that's that's all about it and yeah that's how that's it. basically how we look at things um, pretty much in medical school so we we say oh. of course oh yeah, it's an endocrine organ and secretes things. But generally speaking, like the overall impression I got is still 
this is just a fat cell, you know, and we know what fat cells do. And even when we had um, our anatomy classes, we were just cutting away the cutting away the fat and just throwing it away because there was nothing interesting in observing and looking at fat. Like we know it's fat and there is the, uh, there is the, um, uh, um, 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 I, I, I don't know the English word, the omentum maius, this fat yeah. thing that surrounds the internal omentum. organs, omentum, it's, it's it's the major omentum. omentum, yeah, and there's the minor one, but it doesn't matter. And it's also just fat and we don't, we don't really know what it's doing. So, but you know, it's fat and then you have visceral fat and it's also fat. So it accumulates um, it, it accumulates fatty acids and triglycerides, and that's basically the end of the story. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think it's a century-old box, so that's why it's so difficult for for the medical um, uh, complex to to get over it because yeah. uh, it, it's it's a hundred years of it, it 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 it's never looked complex enough, and it took uh, several decades of uh, adipose tissue research, I think. When leptin was uh, discovered, was it in, in the 90s, 93 or 97 or something like that? So it's already 25 years at least. Wow. And, and uh, that's when uh, people started recognizing and then, uh, you know, these publications in, in high, very high profile uh, journals uh, and, and uh, then dozens and hundreds of them uh, saying that it's an endocrine, endocrine organ. Hmm. And then it's it's now accepted by by the mainstream medicine, but it's 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 much more than than a, than a, uh, an organ which also uh, secretes uh, hormones. Uh, so still, the mainstream view is that uh, the uh, fat cells uh, store energy and release energy, yeah. but they can also uh, release hormones. So now mm -hmm. they add this that uh, well, they can also release hormones, but it's, it's pretty much. It's they also different. added they also added that it has an inflammatory component. It can and can secrete cytokines and other uh, inflammatory molecules. But um, we know you know they still add the comment that well we don't really know what it's doing. It's like it's secreting chemokines and cytokines, but whatever that means. I think it's the first question should be uh, immediately which which adipose tissue, hmm. because uh, these are are functionally different, morphologically different, functionally different, and uh, and uh, um, you have different uh, uh, immune cells uh, residing in different uh, adipose uh, depots, and uh, different adipose depots have different uh, physiological uh, functions. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the, the, this is why the simplistic view is still mainstream that uh, the metabolic problems occur when your subcutaneous fat cannot store uh, uh, lipids or, or fats uh, efficiently anymore. Then it overflows to everywhere. First, it overflows to other uh, to other uh, adipose uh, tissue depots like visceral fat, mm -hmm. and then and so on and so forth. Because that's that's coming from the old world view of storage and storage and, and uh, storage. Yeah. Um, while uh, during um, researching adipose uh, tissues and especially visceral fat uh, physiology and uh, recognizing that uh, it has a co close relationship with uh, the gut immune system, um, then then uh, I realized that it, it could work the comp completely opposite way. Mm -hmm. So it could be that uh, the, the, the enlargement of uh, visceral fat occurs first, mm. And when it cannot do the job uh, properly, then it overflows to other uh, adipose uh, depots. It's 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 perfectly plausible because what we see in in uh, biology, uh, if you challenge a, a specific organ, I think that the most basic example is uh, muscles. Hmm. When you challenge muscles, muscles grow. If you challenge a immune uh, organ like uh, lymphoid tissues, mm -hmm. you have these. Uh, tertiary uh, immune uh, uh, organs developing, which are not there. For, for example, you can you have a chronic inflammation somewhere and you develop uh, immune structures around that, uh, which are very similar to lymph nodes. So in, in areas of the body where the there are no, no lymph nodes, if there is a chronic inflammation, uh, a, a lymphoid structure builds up which supports that area wow. specifically, yeah, it's, it's almost like a new uh, lymph node. Yeah. It's, it's uh, similar. So why it's implausible uh, or, or a crazy idea even that uh, when you challenge, for example, your visceral fat, it starts growing. 
and it's perfectly normal because it's it's just reacting it just reacts to the to the to the challenge if there is continued uh high level of challenge and it keeps growing until it reaches the sure. level where where it it can uh, deal with uh with the with the challenge so but let me ask you this question then um don't we have also people who are very like very large very obese but still present themselves with a relatively low level of um, visceral adipose tissue. Yeah. So how how would we what, what would be the explanation for these sorts of phenomena? Yeah, we, where people we have... seem to be metabolically healthy, and yeah, like yeah. visceral f- adipose tissue and metabolic health is pretty much the same the same thing. So many of the problems are very tightly correlated with high amounts of visceral adipose tissue, as far as like insulin resistance, etc., is concerned, and. Yeah, how 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 then can it be that people who are ex- very obese can can potentially still be relatively metabolically healthy with low amounts of visceral adipose fat? Yeah, but, but when you when you dig a, a little bit uh, even deeper than that, um, you you realize that there are studies which uh, which go further and uh, compare uh, different ratios. Mm. So visceral to subcutaneous, and then uh, lean mass to fat mass, and then uh, fat mass is uh, fat mass broken up uh, into into visceral and and uh, subcutaneous, and then you start realizing that it's uh, it's all about uh, function and not not the amounts. So so how it works, and uh, the same for example the same level of uh, visceral fat. Uh, may cause absolutely no issues in in a certain individual, mm. and then uh, it causes uh, an absolute uh, metabolic disaster in in, in another person. Mm. So uh, uh, again, this is this is I think that the basis basics of human thinking. We we, we love to add absolute values to of course uh, absolute numbers to to certain uh, problems that and that uh, everything behaves have, the same, right? If we have a certain yeah, amount of something, it have, has to behave uh, the same way. If you have two thousand and four hundred and fifty cubic centimeters of uh, visceral fat, it must be bad, and then then you have uh, problems. No, no, it doesn't yeah, yeah. work like. That it's 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 all about function, and then you have population level uh, correlations. Uh, even if these correlations are strong, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the is the volume, the amount which which uh, causes the problem. It's it may be a sign that uh, there is a bigger challenge uh, to which the body reacts in a in a more pronounced way. Uh, but uh, and that's that's why uh, the correlation is strong on a population level. Mm-hmm. But it tells you very little uh, at at an uh, individual level. So it's it's not the same uh, when when looking at population level correlations and and individuals with uh, certain mm-hmm. uh, or, or very specific amounts of uh, different fat depots and and the lean mass and fat mass and these kind of things. So that's why that's why then you then you go then you need to go for for the for the met- metabolic markers uh, like uh, glucose insulin uh, inflammatory markers hormones uh, other hormones like uh, uh, adiponectin and leptin ratios and these kind of things to to find out what's happening in in any uh, individual uh, because uh, you won't be able to say, say with high certainty that uh, oh okay you have uh, Two liters of visceral fat, which is which must be bad. Mm. Can you can you um, can you give me an idea of what you mean by function of visceral adipose tissue? Like, what exactly yeah, I, I does it do? And then the next the follow up question, obviously, would be: Well, if there's differences among individuals between their function, then what influences this? What what is what what has an impact on visceral adipose fat as far as quality let's say is concerned like obviously we don't want <laughs> we don't want hype yeah, whatever 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 quality means but we don't really want to have adipose tissue but if there's an influence what ha- what what does have an impact on on it i think uh, medicine historically was great uh because it started with anatomy hmm. and then uh, building uh, physiology uh based on the anatomy so how it looks hmm. how it is uh, put together, and then uh, how how this uh, works, uh, integrating the anatomy into the physiology. So I st- I still believe that uh, functional anatomy is uh, what what physiology phys- physiology physiology is basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's functional anatomy, and there is a reason why uh, this anatomy developed. But uh, the problem is with medicine 
that uh, the older uh, branch of medicine is, uh, the more difficult to change anything uh, in it. So this 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 is specifically true uh, for for uh, anatomy. Uh, we we think that uh, the anatomy started I don't know how many thousands of years ago, and then it restarted uh in in italy in the renaissance in the 1500s or whenever and then it's 500 years old so you cannot tell us uh, anything we we have read on it with the molecular and the intravital microscopy and whatever yeah. so so it's we confirmed everything works the same way no it's 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 not always true and one area where new developments uh came out is actually the 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 anatomy of uh, of the uh, mesentery which is uh, the the main main uh, visceral fat depot in in humans, right? And actually, it's the only uh, true visceral fat uh, depot in uh, rodents, or spe- uh, more specifically in mouse, in mice. Mm. And it's 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 never used as uh, such, almost never. So when you when you look at um, so uh, I mean real real visceral depot it's usually called which empties into the portal circulation mm-hmm. so which uh, reaches the liver directly uh, and and uh, in humans there are two depots two true two true depots which empty into the portal circulation one is the omentum which mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned previously and the other one the, the bigger one the usually bigger one is is the mesentery mm-hmm. and the mesentery if you have a uh, anatomical look i think it, it has always been neglected and only very recently which is uh, very strange i find it very strange uh, gained some momentum to to uh, for 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 some anatomists to have a more deeper uh, look into it and it was discovered that uh, it's 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 almost like a continuous organ attached to the to the bowels yeah uh, but but uh, even if it looks uh, as uh, as a one looks like a a single organ, uh, the the arrangement of of the of the mesentery is uh, very different based on anatomical locations, especially the the immune uh, uh, arrangements, the the lymph nodes which drain and which are embedded in the mesentery mm-hmm. uh, are are uh, very different uh, by f- physiology. So you know, uh, some areas uh, are emptied by lymph nodes which are embedded in the pancreas, mm-hmm. and uh, other uh, all the others are embedded directly in in the in the mesentery, and it's always embedded in fat. Mm. And um, these these are not uh, typical uh, lipid storage uh, fat cells. Actually, there is a there is a, a gradation a radius as you go out from the from the lymph, lymph node itself, uh, and uh, if you are get further and further away, then uh, farther and farther away, then uh, it's uh, uh, the the composition of fat cells uh, changes as well. Mm. So uh, closer to the lymph nodes, you have more specific fat cells which have uh, almost exclusive function of uh, supplying. Uh, the lymph nodes with specific fats, lipids, and it's it comes uh, with no surprise to me that uh, these fat cells uh, uh, store more uh, polyunsaturated fats, mm-hmm. long chain polyunsaturated unsaturated fats, which play a huge role, you know, in inflammatory processes. Mm. So we went when you when they these have to supply uh, the immune cells in, in lymph nodes with uh, like ome- omega threes or omega sixes. For different inflammatory processes, these are able to do that specifically. So it's not like the fat is coming out uh, randomly from fat cells. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it it uh, happens in a very controlled way. Mm. So uh, fat cells can release the the fat molecules which are required by by the lymph nodes. Um, so that's why I and also the the arrangement of uh, of the lymphatic system. Between the the, the gut, uh, the intestines, and and uh, the the mesentery, is is very 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 specific. So uh, if you have a look at how lymphatics is collected from the small intestines, for mm-hmm. example, and how it's intricately linked to lipid absorption, mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, then then you realize that these uh, lipoproteins uh, have a first pass through uh, the the uh, 
the lymphatics mm. and the lymphatics are embedded embedded in the mesentery and mesenteric lymph nodes and mesenteric fat cells play a specific role in uh, patrolling uh, what's coming in from from the from the digestive system oh yeah that makes good sense eh because because so, we, we we never we never were off, we were never offered an explanation for why exactly the fat like fat dietary fat chylomicrons have first to pass the entire lymphatic system until they're uh, delivered to the venous venous system and it was always said like yeah this is how it is and there might be explanations we don't really know like I, I think I asked this question several times and I, I was never offered a satisfaction yeah, the, satisfactory explanation but it there has to be one like it's not it's not by accident that these sorts of things were uh, are happening in every single human being you know yeah basically everything else goes directly to the liver right then why not lipids yeah right, right into the venous circulation and important to the portal vein yes like that's the okay. that's the usual way of how amino acids are absorbed glucose is absorbed like but that's not the, the case for fatty acids and so it's, I think it's very simple. The, the explanation is very simple because uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, bacterial compounds, uh, which which uh, have a um, kind of an immune patrol demand, uh, are, are absorbed uh, with lipids. Mm. And then, uh, if you if you I hit see. the liver, if you hit the liver directly, or even though the liver has its own uh, portal immune system filtering the stuff which comes uh, from the gut, uh, it's insufficient in uh, doing a, a uh, proper filtering job if everything hits uh, and the majority of, of this bacterial stuff uh, is delivered uh, in uh, together with the lipids. Mm. So you need, a, you need an immu immune organ which uh, first uh, filters, has its first pass on on the on the lipids coming in wow and this yeah. is this is what i believe after some years of uh reading into this what the, what the mesentery does yeah so that, that is, makes so, that, ma that makes good sense so you say this is one function you might say of visceral fat i would say it's the major it's the main function okay of of uh, of uh, i don't really like the visceral fat um but but um, I think in general we can say that visceral fat uh, is more a immune support organ than uh, than a fat storage organ. Right. The fat storage is is uh, is intimately interwoven with uh, with uh, with the, the immunological um, uh, function because you know these omega threes, omega sixes. Uh, are su supplied, but also uh, it's it's a it's a matrix with immune cells, and this is what you see in other lesser uh, known uh, visceral fat depots like uh, epicardial fat or peri mm, pericardial mm. perivascular fat uh, depots, which are small uh, fat pads around uh, different uh, organs. different uh, organs, and then then you start uh, seeing uh, this. Uh, this is something like you you once see it and then you cannot unsee it <laughs> that then you start contributing the same uh, function to to other depots and th then you check the literature and indeed uh, there is a huge uh, strong correlation between like these uh, uh, perivascular fat with with uh, different uh, vascular diseases vascular yeah. inflammatory vascular inflammatory proce uh, processes or or pericardial or epicardial fat depots with with uh, with uh, coronary diseases and and these kind mm. of things and, and uh, uh, then then uh, you see the, the correlation of studies in in humans and then uh, there are also some studies when they uh, get a sample uh, out 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 of these uh, specific small depots and examine the the immune landscape you know the immune cells and the inflammatory uh, molecules and uh, the the different ratio of uh, inflammatory macrophages and anti anti-inflammatory macrophages and these kind of things and it's 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 kind of uh, uh convincing that uh, these always nicely correlate with uh, with the disease uh, processes so when you see a more advanced uh, vascular disease for example let it be uh, a, a aortic uh, problem mm. or, or a, a coronary problem the the adjacent um, uh, 
so-called visceral fat depot is always inflamed, enlarged, and it's full yeah. of uh, inflammatory uh, stuff. So it's a, there's a whole close interaction of, uh, between uh, the inflammatory processes in different organs and the surrounding immune support. Uh, vascular uh, fat pads. Okay, then let so, me ask you a follow-up question on that, because that's really interesting now. Um, you said it has this immunological function, and that actually yeah. makes perfect sense if we look at the anatomy and um, the lymphatic system embedded in the in the uh, visceral adipose fat. But then um, you talked about inflammation, and we know, we both know, we all know, inflammation is the the body's reaction to to what to uh, damage so if there is damage occurring repeated damage let's yeah, say or, then you or have... in general general stress stress yeah stress and damage like stress and oftentimes that goes hand in hand with with some sort of damage right it can be tissue damage it can yeah. be it can be uh, invasion by a pathogen let's say then you have an inflammatory response to protect your body so it's a protective response it's not necessarily a spot response that is uh, supposed to cause extra damage, although it sometimes does if it's excessive and chronic. Um, and then my question is, as far as adipose, visceral adipose fat is concerned, um, we oftentimes think about visceral adipose tissue as causal in disease. Um, like if we think about insulin resistance, diabetes, it's like visceral adipose tissue is so tightly correlated with all these, with all these things that it has to be causing them. And what, what do you think about that? Is it just a correlation so that we might we might also think that there is some something that causes the disease the body reacts by accumulating more visceral adipose fat to increase the uh, the the immunological uh, response to this sort of sorts of sort of stressor that is repeated and then there is is is, is that what you what you think is happening and then we might we might obviously suggest that by this chronic inflammatory state, this exacerbates the problem on the long run. But in the initial phase, is visceral adipose fat, like something leads to the accumulation of visceral adipose fat, is visceral adipose fat exacerbating the problem right, ab right away, or is it first trying to solve it? No, what is the error of causality? It's, it's definitely the, the first thing it does is, is uh, filter filter the uh, stuff coming in from the gut. And then uh, if if there is a bigger need for, for filtration, meaning that, uh, that there are more and more uh, compounds uh, or bacteria, even whole bacteria or bacterial fragments or bacterial uh, lipopolysaccharides and, and uh, LTA and flagellins and all this uh, stuff which we have uh, evolved with yeah. uh, over, over millennia, but uh, that there can be a, and it's yeah, it, it's it's not not all, not even that simple that we have these inflammatory compounds coming in and and then uh, we develop the the inflammation. It's uh, it's it's a problem with the bacterial imbalance mm -hmm. uh, because uh, some lipopolysaccharides, for example, are anti-inflammatory. Mm. So it's not like all lipopolysaccharides are the same and Obviously. they all cause inflammation and and, and uh, so you need an imbalance in the gut in the gut which causes this trigger and then uh, another very uh, very very basic uh, biological uh, observation is if you have chronic stimulation or you you, you are dealing with acute uh, bouts of of stimulation it's it's uh, very different how the body reacts. Mm. Um, because when you have chronic stimulation, two things can happen, and uh, they happen uh, usually in in parallel. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, you can always react the same way, or you can kind of develop a level of tolerance. So it's always uh, from an immunological perspective, it's it's a tolerance and uh, the, the the inflammatory reaction uh, because. Always delivering the same high level of inflama inflammation is is actually damaging yeah. to the body. So it's uh, you you have to f find the balance uh, of of inflammation and tolerance, which is the kind of the sweet spot and maximizes your your future uh, prospects. And this is, I think, what happens with uh, with visceral fat. So. Uh, uh, it, it can expand to certain levels mm -hmm. and increasing the inflammation 
if it's chronically challenged. But after a while, it it it, it will develop some level of tolerance uh, inadvertently because uh, it cannot go on uh, with with uh, constantly increasing the level of uh, inflammation because then the inflammation itself will be more damaging exactly than, than what's coming in from the gut. So that 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 is, I think. Uh, what happens in in uh, typical cases? So uh, you have an organ. If you if you adopt this view, you have an organ uh, of which uh, the the major function is uh, immunological. Mm -hmm. So it filters uh, what's coming in from the gut in a very simplistic way, and then uh, if it's challenged in a chronic way, uh, it reacts with expansion. Mm -hmm. So it's it's basically uh, trying to protect you. Everything yeah. is trying to protect you in your body as a first. Right, uh, right. Uh, Look, I had I had a discussion quite a while ago with. Uh, are you familiar with? Um, you probably are with Dr. Sean O'Mara, the sure, MRI yes. adipose, uh, visceral adipose yes. fat guy. I I actually talked to him. Unfortunately, there was a problem with recording the podcast, so I couldn't publish mm -hmm. it because I didn't have the 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 video file, which was which was a pity, but. That's what happened. I hope I, I have a chance to talk to him again soon. And I asked him this. I asked him, is it possible that visceral adipose fat is a protective mechanism by the body? And he wasn't really happy about that question. He replied something like, no, it's a disease. It's like cancer. There's nothing good about it. And I can understand where, where he's coming from because we, we, we always see this correlation between high adipose fat, uh, visceral adipose fat and a whole bunch of different diseases that it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that there might be a protective uh, what component to the body trying to respond to something that is damaging from the environment by increasing the amount of visceral adipose fat. But this is actually something that sounds more plausible to me because like virtually everything in your body is based, evolutionarily speaking, on me mechanisms trying to protect you. Yeah, there are, I think there are uh, two scenarios here. And uh, one is that uh, you deal the two, two potential problems, basic problems. One is that uh, you deal with uh, evolutionarily uh, rare uh, challenges. True. So th there is a, there is a challenge which which looks like an old challenge. So re you react the old way. The, the the main difference being that it's it's now chronic and not acute. It used to be acute. So for example, you had a very uh, specific time of the year when you had these uh, uh, nutrients coming in uh, together, like let's say fat and sugar together. Right. For a very short period of uh, the year, when then then you you are adopted adapted to this uh, with reacting like storing uh, fat in in uh, as as an immune uh, filtration uh, expansion in your in your belly, and then uh, winter comes and this melts away and the problem is solved. Uh, but what if this uh, challenge occurs in a chronic way? So this is one theory. The other theory is that we have completely new. Uh, evolutionarily new uh, challenges for which we are not adapted at all yeah and then we react the old way because that's that's the kind of reaction what we have in our uh, as best we have way. yeah that that's the tool we have so we react that way but it's it, it, that this reaction is inappropriate because it, it 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 is it was not meant to deal with this new type of challenge so i think we have to decide what is happening First of all, that this is a, is it a new challenge or is it just a chronic challenge instead of a historically evolutionarily uh, acute challenge? So yeah, this really is a very, like very, very basic, mm -hmm. yeah, very basic thing we, we have to decide. Otherwise, we are just shooting in the dark and and uh, debating things which have no no proper basis. So if 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 your stance is not based on one of these, then uh, mm -hmm. how can we debate? Then, properly? but then then we could go a step further and ask, and you probably have an idea about that. Uh, what causes accumulation of visceral adipose fat. And then yeah. we can, if we understand that, at least to some degree, then we might start drawing a conclusion to uh, about um, if if there is an evol evolutionary context to that. Because if we say this is what's driving accumulation of visceral adipose fat, and it's something that's entirely new, and we have never been exposed to that ever before, then the hypothesis, it's new and we're not adapted to that, holds true. But if we say 
we have been exposed to that, but in lesser amounts and not as chronically, then there might be a mechanism that 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 relies yeah, on evolution. We can go even further and, and yep. uh, start thinking about what if we have both in our in our new environment. So, for example, yeah, you know, you perfectly, know, we have these sense. we have these endocrine disrupting chemicals, you know, the BPA and and all, all of these organic compounds which we started uh, putting into uh, plastics and 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 and, and other other uh, modern. Uh, uh, equipments and uh, it, these keep leaking, and we are now exposed from from all around. And and some of the actually some of the the metals, the heavy metals, can behave the same. Arsenic can uh, have the same effect. So it looks like if if uh, some kind of a mild chronic poisoning is going on, it, it could be a unifying mechanism. And and uh, and uh, that's why we react uh, the same uh, all the time. Yeah, even uh, if it's this, new, even if the like yeah, molecule, uh, the composition is new, we have a mechanism yeah, you know, to it's, react. It's to something foreign... like when the fish, when the fish uh, start accumulating the uh, the mercury in in their eggs, for example, because they don't know what it is. It looks like a useful heavy metal, when the heavy metals are usually uh, necessary for at least the heavy metals which uh, these organisms uh, had been exposed to millennia uh, or millions of years uh, had been uh, useful. For them, but then they start accumulating mercury in their eggs, which is detrimental, mm -hmm. or start accumulating mercury in other uh, tissues uh, for longer-lived uh, fish. Uh, so uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 how we handle uh, these compounds. We have these organic compounds, and if the even if the body uh, determines that uh, this is uh, toxic, it will store away. Because the the best uh, way to if if you cannot excrete it immediately, and then when it's it's coming in with food, for mm. example, you cannot ex excrete it because uh, right after feeding you are in a storage mode, yeah. and you are not in excretion mode, so you have to store it. And uh, the safest uh, way to store it is to hide deep inside uh, fat cells. Yeah. But the pro problem occurs when you start losing weight, for example. And I, I, I heard and experienced uh, myself, I heard way too many stories that uh, when losing weight, uh, they, they are suddenly triggered and uh, some some weird disease uh, develops, uh, autoimmune disease or, or some other uh, weird disease uh, following weight loss. Yeah, you're because you're liberating, uh, liber liberating toxic substances from your fat yes, cells? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think most people should use some uh, kind of a detoxification together with weight loss, mm. which helps them uh, rid of uh, these uh, toxic compounds uh, stored away safely in their fat cells. Because mm. when there is a uh, uh, very substantial weight loss, these uh, uh, these uh, compounds uh, are also liberated, which is which is in high amounts is uh, absolutely toxic. Mm -hmm. So this this is and and, and then uh, also. When you have a look at, uh, uh, is it also called in German a beer belly? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's so, it's so, beer bauch, bauch is belly, so it's yeah. like beer belly. So, <laughs> so it's called a beer belly, and uh, there is a reason for that. I think it's a good ob observation. And then we have a lot of uh, studies on uh, non-alcoholic. Now it's called metabolically associated whatever liver disease, but uh, historically it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver yeah. disease. And uh, you have alcoholic fatty liver disease. And these these uh, two always go hand in hand: the beer belly and the alcoholic uh, liver disease. Mm. And some people with with uh, big beer bellies don't really develop uh, liver disease, and some with uh, smaller uh, bellies. It's very similar to how you can store fat uh, when you have lipodystrophy and when you have me metabolically healthy obesity. These uh, two extremes. Uh, this also happens to a less, lesser extent with the beer bellies. And yeah. some people can grow huge bellies and don't develop uh, liver disease. Mm. And other, other people cannot grow those huge bellies and then develop, do develop uh, liver disease. And then, that is the, then of course, uh, the majority of people are in between on, on, a, on a wide spectrum. Yeah. So, so this is where, where I also started, started thinking about uh, probably this uh, visceral fat is also a protective mechanism. And then there is a, uh, there are differences either in uh, the environmental exposure or in the personal genetics or, or gut microbes or whatever. So, so that there, there is this, always this interaction uh, in, in uh, the immunity, microbes and, and uh, environmental exposures. Mm. 
uh, which determine the individual outcome. Uh, but but uh, why would why would we think that that visceral fat is any different than than other fat depots? And then then I also developed the view that uh, most likely obesity itself is protective. Oh uh, yeah. That and and then then we we don't do not really have the properly designed uh, studies that uh, when we when we have obesity uh, or, or following a challenge if the life expectancy and and uh, is is uh, or, or the reprodu- reproductive capacity of the animal is the same when it cannot get obese so we probably have the genetic uh, tools now to to cripple uh adipogenesis or or a healthy way of uh, getting fat and and see what the outcomes are on on uh, mouse models for example yeah. because mouse mice only live for one or two years so it's uh, you can you can have a look at how they can reproduce what is their lifespan what is their general health uh, span or what level of health uh, uh, deterioration occurs and these kind of things. We still have because... to be careful when we say um, uh, obesity is protective because we don't mean it in a sense when uh, in the same sense when we say muscle is protective because when we say muscle is protective we mean build as much muscle as you can and then you protect it from disease. That's not the case for obesity. We, we're not saying get as fat as you can because then you protect it. It's, it's, no, it's no, a little no, different. Just, it's it's when you're exposed the... to, to certain yeah. environmental factors that are negative, that are certainly negative, then the body reacts in a protective way. As 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 the body reacts with high temperature when you when you when you have a when you have an infection, the the temperature is protective, but on the long run it's definitely not positive. It's dangerous. It degrades like proteins and enzymes. So there's nothing good about high temperature on the long run, but it's protective. So that's what we mean by um, it, it it might have a protective role. Yeah, very very specifically meaning it it means that uh, that uh, it's better to to gain fat to get more obese than not to in the get same environment obese if if you have the same challenge right right and we we have people for example in Asian countries in India that can't grow large they stay skinny skinny fat and they they become metabolically unhealthy very rapidly they have way more diabetes than um, anywhere else because for some reason then they can't become obese. But in countries like the US, obviously diabetes incidence is very high, but they are way more likely to become extremely obese and accumulate a bunch of fat, which might be protective given the same environmental uh, influences. Yeah, arguably, I think uh, this is how we should uh, define it. Uh, definitely, arguably, the, the best thing is not to be exposed to these uh, detrimental Agreed. environmental factors. Yeah, obviously. So uh, don't don't eat crap. Uh, keep your muscles uh, moving and and uh, no, not uh, extremely uh, uh, thin and then these kind of things. So uh, maintain a certain level of uh, muscle mass. Um, yeah, that there are ways. Uh, maintain low stress levels and, and many, many uh, lifestyle factors. So the best thing is to do that. Uh, but from a scientific point of view, uh, uh, arguing that uh, that uh, your, your any kind of fat tissue is there to kill you is, is, uh, is nonsensical, I believe, mm. because that's not how evolution works. So you, you wouldn't have a any kind of uh, uh, adipose tissue if it was detrimental to your health. Yeah, it's like what causes the adipose tissue to expand is what's trying to kill you. The body tries to de to 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 uh, what would you say to decelerate to uh, make uh, yet yeah, to to make the problem less severe by expanding adipose tissue. But it's not the tissue yeah, that you... kills you. If you, like, if you lead a if you lead a crappy lifestyle, it's better. Uh, it's still better to get more obese than not to get uh, obese and get diabetic. Absolutely. So we we can turn it around and say that we we are not living in a obesogenic environment, but we are living in a diabetogenic environment. Mm. And uh, your fat tries to uh, save you from diabetes, and that's why you are getting obese. So this is just a spin on on uh, on the same observations. That makes. That, that makes good sense. And I've been thinking about the conundrum like of diabetes um, because diabetes, we, we, all, we all know this correlation between obesity and diabetes, right? And then the immediate conclusion we jump to is obesity causes, oh no, sorry, yeah, obesity causes diabetes. 
And I was thinking, I don't know, like evolutionarily doesn't make that much that much sense because what if diabetes itself or insulin resistance itself is also a protective mechanism to protect the cell. I always try to, to approach these problems with this question. What is the mechanism? Why does the body do that? Especially if it's so ubiquitous. You know, if it's something that happens very rarely, then you might argue it's a genetic abnormality, like sickle cell disease, disease all these genetic abnormalities that kill you right away or very quickly. Obviously, that's not normal. That's not a protective mechanism. That's like an abnormality. But if it happens to virtually everyone, there has to be some sort of reasonable explanation to that. Yeah, another another area which can provide some some uh, good clues is uh, the um, the area of uh, torpor. You know, when when uh, animals uh, uh, fatten up before the winter mm -hmm. and then they go down, their, their metabolism drops to very low levels and they survive the winter, uh, living off their their fat uh, depots. You know, like for example, bears. Or or, or uh, squirrels and these animals uh, mm -hmm. uh, fatten up before the winter, but they never get diabetic. Mm. And uh, that's because all this happens in an evolutionary uh, appropriate uh, manner. So, uh, uh, and, and I think uh, it has some some uh, uh, useful information. It, it's for, it's a useful input also for for humans that. Uh, what the difference could be between uh, getting obese uh, this way for, for, for torpor and getting obese in the human way, mm. which for most people reaches a level uh, that, that uh, breaks uh, their metabolism. Yeah. And, and um, I think there are, from time to time, I read a new study on, on hibernation of of uh, of these animals and uh, i think it's uh, it's very useful how their kidneys cope with uh, all the problems what you what you have uh, during hibernation and, and uh, of course they have a more specific uh, adaptation to these states than than we humans because we don't enter uh, torpor we, we do not hibernate mm. but uh, but uh, th these animals are not that much far away in physiology from from us a bear for example so uh, it's similar uh, enough yeah yeah there is a lot of useful information we can derive uh from from those studies as well yeah i i agree maybe before we wrap up because unfortunately i have to run soon i'd love i'd love to have you on a, a second time to dive a little deeper into that because we let's say we scratched the surface on obesity and little metabolic disease and diabetes and visceral fat but there, i think there's much more interesting stuff to discuss what is your what 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 t tell us what you do to maintain a good metabolic health and what you w would potentially advise people to be doing like obviously none of this is medical advice but on a on a yeah. what let just 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 tell what what you would do in order to protect yourself i think uh, that there are a couple of uh, things to avoid which i can also uh, observe on myself and when it goes uh, when it derails for example stress the level yeah. of uh, stress uh, should be below a certain level because if if you are above a certain level of stress, there is no thing you can do with uh, with your uh, diet, for example. I, I also have a, have uh, friends with huge beer beer bellies, and and I gave them some uh, lifestyle dietary advice, and then uh, they lost uh, uh, some weight, and then then uh, it stopped, and then I was absolutely. Uh, shocked that uh, they cannot lose more weight and then uh, it turned out that uh, uh, one specific guy for example uh, sleeps uh, between uh, 3 a.m and, and 7 a.m so it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's that uh, three four hours uh, every every single day and uh, if, if you maintain such a high level of stress because basically what it causes is is, is stress and high cortisol and and, and and there is no way what you can do with with uh, the, whatever extreme diet you 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 go on. It's uh, it's impossible. Yeah, stress so, is a first, huge one. You know, it's very underrated, very underappreciated because it's too abstract. We can't really measure it. It's very complicated. It consists of a bunch of factors, but it ties everything together. You know, it it, yeah. it it influences your diet. It influences the way you sleep. It influences the way you move. It influences. Uh, your diabetes risk it influences hormones it's so it's so it's so amazing 
Yeah, you can you can probably limit uh, the detrimental effects of stress with other uh, lifestyle interventions, including diet, but you cannot yeah, 100% sure. uh, exclude them. I, I I had been in this farm hunting project earlier this year, and it was very stressful for for several reasons and for a relatively long uh, period of time. It, it went on for at least half a year, and in half of a year, uh, I myself gained something like uh, two three uh, kilos, despite trying to uh, be careful with my uh, sleep and and and, and uh, food and, and these kind of things but uh, still if your general stress level is high uh, your your uh, room for for improvement with with other lifestyle factors is very limited so that that would be my first uh, recommendation to to eliminate uh, chronic stress as much as you can from from your life and then uh, of course it includes sleep which is mm. which is one uh, stress factor uh, uh, too short and then poor quality sleep and uh, then of course uh, obvious uh, st- uh, stress factors and then uh, yeah then we can talk about uh, food uh, feeding patterns and what foods uh, food items you put in your mouth and how frequently and these kind of uh, things i think there there are some very uh, easy rules uh, to follow, which I already highlighted in my 2018 uh, food news uh, yeah. lecture. Uh, you can find it in the in the summary. So uh, I think if you can exclude uh, wheat, barley, and some similar grains from your diet, and only eat uh, rye and and oats, for example, yeah. from the grains. And then uh, leave out uh, very high amounts of uh, refined sugar, mm. and uh, what, what the remaining amount of uh, refined carbohydrates what you eat, place them to the end of the meals as as dessert. Yeah. So don't do not snack on on these, uh, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, if you follow a proper food order within any meals, like start with a salad. Uh, for example, a green salad, if you like it, it's not mandatory, but it helps mm-hmm. uh, slow down. It, it is very useful if you consume uh, quick absorbing carbohydrates, yeah. because it, it can slow down the absorption. So you start with a green salad, in, eat your proteins and, and eat your quick absorbing carbs last uh, in a meal. Uh, do not snack, uh, especially uh, not in the evening, mm-hmm. late in the evening. Uh, I think uh, these are very basic advices which can uh, work uh, really nice. I have friends in India who who have uh, difficulties to uh, leave out a lot of uh, carbohydrate sources from their diet because those are cheap and they cannot afford uh, to go on a full-blown keto diet or mm-hmm. meat-only diet or whatever fancy uh, diet. So uh, they started implementing uh, these advices to... Uh, reduce wheat and and uh, white rice and barley, for example, mm-hmm. and uh, add in other other uh, more slowly absorbing grain uh, sources. Whatever they still eat, uh, rice or 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 wheat or or sugars, they add it to the to the end of their meals. And even diabetics saw a huge improvement in in their glycemic uh, control and and long term uh, well being. So so I think these are very very easy to implement uh, simple advices. Yeah, yeah, really, really appreciated that um, that that comment. And t- t- tell us again where where they can find this lecture. How it is called? What's the name of it? Uh, it's Food News. Food News. Food Food News uh, 2018. Okay. I think it's still still up on YouTube in on Ivor Cummins uh, channel. Yeah. But uh, if you search, you can uh, easily find it. Uh, there are more refined, but not openly accessible versions right now of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I extended and and uh, reworked, but the, but the very basics are still the same. Of course, I added more supporting evidence from more uh, more sides of of uh, the this gut hormone uh, and uh, and microbe uh, food interaction. Um, so the the very basics, which which I identified something like uh, five years ago, was that uh, it's accelerated uh, absorption of especially refined carbohydrates, which drives uh, metabolic abnormalities. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, uh, remove the accelerated absorption, it's not, it doesn't necessarily equal to removing all these these food items, just uh, uh, exclude the quick absorption, Mm. the quick delivery 
uh, of, of uh, these food items, then uh, it delivers uh, the vast majority of the benefits. So mm-hmm. it's like the Pareto's principle that right. uh, uh, just implementing 20% of the strict uh, measures delivers 80% of the benefits. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's a good idea. Not obsessing over details, but keeping the big picture in mind, doing the most. Yeah, I mean, stuff. yeah, of course, going uh, very low carb, for example, it's it's also a simple solution because you already sure. have to take care of uh, of one one uh, problem, one source of uh, problem. But it's uh, I think that's not a not a mechanism of uh, how metabolic disease is initiated by food, and it's not mm. always initiated by food only. Uh, or, or food at all. So uh, when it's, but most most uh, commonly it's food related. Then it's uh, industrially refined food related. So if you can, uh, and if you if you recognize the, the the underlying mechanism, it's much easier to address it without being extremely strict about uh, diet. Yeah. Um, last question: Where can where can people find more about what you do? Where are you active? And um... I think. Uh, Recently, I'm most active on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if it's, it's my handle is my name. It's uh, G E R D O S I. So Gerdosi is uh, Gabor Gerdosi. So from from my name, mm-hmm. that's my handle on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on Metabolic dot mm. uh, org because uh, that's where I partly work, I partly enjoy the, the, the research mm-hmm. around metabolic uh, diseases. Um, yeah, that's more like it. I have a personal web page, which is, which is still not functional yet. Mm-hmm. So, so that's also my name, but it's uh, with, with the uh, Slovenian uh, domain, because my, my name uh, ends with SI, and then I decided I, I uh, blocked this domain in, in Slovenia, so I... It's the shortest way to, but it's still not, not operational. So. Okay, okay. Well, I'll link to everything else then in the show notes. Uh, can people can find find more? Okay, thank you. Well, it's been it's been really great. I'll, I'd love to to have you on again to dive a little deeper into all these subjects. But I really enjoyed the conversation we had. Yeah, me too. Thanks for inviting. All right, take care. <laughs>